So where do cavities come from, and how exactly does public water fluoridation prevent them? To answer these questions, we need to learn a bit more about the microorganism responsible, Streptococcus mutans. This is a gram-positive facultative anaerobe, and it's important that we learn what these terms mean. Gram-positive bacteria only have one membrane, coated with a thick layer of peptidoglycan, which is the target for many antibiotics. This makes gram-positive bacteria much easier to combat than the gram-negative counterparts, which have a thinner layer of peptidoglycan, which is safely sandwiched in between two membranes. As facultative anaerobes, Streptococcus mutanes can generate energy either through respiration or through fermentation. When metabolizing carbohydrates through fermentation, Streptococcus mutanes produces a lactic acid byproduct that erodes the enamel on the surface of teeth, causing cavities. Another interesting thing about Streptococcus mutanes is the loosely organized glycocalyx, known as a slime layer. And a slime layer helps colonies of bacteria bond together to form a stronger biofilm. With all this information on the causative agent of cavities, we can see several different ways to fight the pathogens. As gram-positive bacteria, it would be fairly easy to administer an antibiotic, maybe even in toothpaste, killing the pathogen that causes cavities. However, that's a bit excessive, and it does carry the risk of antibiotic resistance. We could use vaccinations, and there are many promising potentials. Again, this would probably be overkill, and it would certainly freak out the anti-vaccine community, which is closely related to the anti-fluoride camp. We could also break up the biofilm, and that's part of the mechanism for brushing and flossing. And most interestingly, we can interrupt the metabolic pathway of Streptococcus mutanes. If we can prevent fermentation, then we stop lactic acid production, and subsequently we prevent cavities from forming in the first place. And this is how fluoridation works. It's still a topical effect because it maintains low levels of fluoride in saliva, which topically interrupts the metabolic pathway of Streptococcus mutanes. Its mechanism is fundamentally different from that of toothbrushing, which is why the two are not a substitute for each other. So how do Streptococcus mutanes ferment carbohydrates to produce energy for the cell and lactic acid as a byproduct? Well, bacterial metabolism is a bit complicated, but all we really need to consider is the fact that metabolic pathways are determined by enzymes, and enzymes are very specific to which reactions they catalyze and the substrates that are involved. Now, you may have heard that enzymes will speed up a chemical reaction, but it's more accurate to think of them as lowering the amount of energy required to complete a chemical reaction. Now, the enzyme has an active site, where a specific substrate will attach. And it's been compared to a lock and key mechanism, but that model has been replaced with the induced fit model, which more accurately describes the flexibility of the active site as it continuously reshapes through interactions with the substrate. Now, there are two ways that an enzyme can be prevented from bonding to the corresponding substrate. Competitive inhibition is when something else is already attached to the active site, preventing the substrate from bonding. Now there's another site called the allosteric site, and when something attaches there, it causes the active site to change shape, which prevents the substrate from bonding. Fluoride bonds very well to the active site on the enolase enzyme, preventing the substrate to phosphoglycerate from bonding. This prevents fermentation and lactic acid production, which prevents cavities. It works best at levels of about one part per million, so fluoridation might actually entail removing naturally occurring fluoride, as well as adding fluoride from other sources when natural sources may be deficient. It's all about balance, having enough fluoride to provide the maximum health benefits without risking the adverse effects that may be associated with very high toxic levels. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all my teachers were tricked by the shadow government that controls the FDA. And maybe all this peer-reviewed science was faked in order to trick the general public into letting the Nazis take over America. I find that very unlikely, because good science is repeatable and falsifiable. And that means that even an amateur like me can theoretically test the effectiveness of fluoridation with the lab equipment I have lying around at home. Phenyl red is a differential medium. It turns from red to yellow in the presence of acid. I could scrape some of the plaque from my teeth and grow the bacteria on an agar plate, and then I could do a gram stain to make sure I have the right microorganism. Once that's established, I would inoculate 500 milliliters of phenyl red glucose broth with about 0.5 microliters of sodium fluoride, simulating the one part per million levels found in most fluoridated water. 
I would then incubate the broth at 37 degrees Celsius for, I don't know, 48 hours. And then I could see if any fermentation occurred. And I should also inoculate a broth without fluoride and use that as a control. Now, I'm no biochemist. I'm just a punk kid with some extra lab equipment in the garage. But the point I'm trying to make is that real science is repeatable. And that means that if fluoride caused cancer and lowered IQ at exposure levels found in municipal water supplies, then there should damn well be a demonstrable causal mechanism. In this video, we've learned a little bit about the causal mechanism of water fluoridation, and we've established that it's testable. So I have a challenge to any conspiracy theorist who may be watching. Can you explain the causal mechanism behind all the adverse health effects that you're so concerned about? And furthermore, can you demonstrate the exposure levels at which these terrifying health effects are supposed to occur? Quoting an internet documentary is not evidence. It's nonsense. Real researchers work very diligently in laboratories all over the world that receive different funding, and their conclusions are rigorously criticized and independently verified. They don't just make this stuff up. But the moral of my video is this. Before storming the Capitol and demanding the removal of fluoride, before burning DVDs to hand out to strangers, and before writing a paper for school, be sure to educate yourself on the subject. Don't just listen to me or Alex Jones. Actually study the peer-reviewed data. And if you have not been professionally trained to read a research paper, then you need to talk to somebody who has, and talk to somebody that you trust, like your dentist or your primary family physician. Most importantly, you need to be prepared to change your position as you learn more information. To be honest with you, changing my mind on fluoride was not easy. But how could I call myself a truther if I was unwilling to acknowledge that I was wrong? Instead of being a truther, I much prefer being a student, because I'm always learning more and more about the real world now that I don't proclaim to already know everything.